All right, we are live on Facebook right now with Congresswoman Ann Wagner from the 2nd Congressional District. You have represented that district since 2013, running for re-election this year against Democrat Jill Shoup. Uh, we understand that you've been fighting for the St. Louis region in Washington now since 2013. So I want to start with what have you accomplished that has directly impacted St. Louisans in that time? Well, thank you, Samantha. First of all, it's great to be with you. You and so glad that KMOB is putting a big uh, Arkansas Razorback fan here. So you're 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 nice. head to head you're to Mizzou Tiger, uh, <laughs> uh, and I think we've been mopping up on you of late here, Samantha. So I don't don't want to say anything. A little here, SEC but... rivalry there. <laughs> so uh, yes, I um, I've been honored and privileged to, um, to to serve. I'm finish up finishing up now what would be my my eighth year in Congress and representing my hometown where I was born and raised, raised my family, have worked, volunteered, worshipped. Uh, this is uh, the daughter of small business owners, little carpet stores out here in West County, worked at Hallmark Cards, Ralston Purina before getting involved in politics and public service. And I'm happy to be <clears throat> running on my record, a record of, of accomplishments. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very the district actually providing services, casework, customer service um, uh, needs for our specific region, whether we're helping people with the IRS issues, um, uh, visa issues, social security issues, whatever it might be, those are really important kind of casework, especially during the pandemic that we have been doing, actually servicing people in the district that need help navigating the, the federal bureaucracy, holding teletown halls, holding open forums in about 10 different municipalities across the area before COVID set in, uh, just this Congress alone. In terms of in Washington, D.C., I've had the privilege of, of uh, having passed landmark uh, human trafficking legislation signed into law by both uh, President Obama and then by President uh, Trump the SAVE Act, and then the FOSTA, the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. These are all bills that uh, turned into law that actually went after these, these horrible internet, backpage.com, City X Guide, saving women and, and um, usually young girls and boys from this horrible scourge of, uh, of sex trafficking. Uh, I'm on foreign affairs, so we do a lot of, of, of work with vulnerable populations, uh, my genocide and atrocity bill and legislation has been uh, uh, something I'm very, very proud of, uh, along with the work we've done to help our, our families, jobs, and the economy. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act is something that, that saved a, a, a middle-class family, median in, income family here in the 2nd District, some $3,000 in keeping more of their hard-earned money. Uh, a lot of regulatory reform legislation that kind of got the government off their backs, reserved preserve more of their freedoms. Um, as I said, my father in the, in the carpet store would say all he wanted was the government off his back and, and out of his way so he could get things done. We've been very effective in our legislation, Samantha. Um, it's been bipartisan, especially in the arena of foreign affairs and in financial services. Um, and I've, you know, had over 10 bills in my name that I have actually passed into law. A Sponsored, but authored and and written uh, have actually passed both in Republican majorities and in Democrat majorities, and I think that's a big difference between myself and um, uh, my my opponent, who in her 12 years in in the state legislature has never passed a piece of legislation and had it signed into law that was actually in her name that she had authored. So I think being effective, delivering, working hard, fighting for whether it's is customer service work and casework in the district, or whether it's passing good, common sense, bipartisan legislation uh, in in D.C. Are, are very important, and I'm I'm pleased to to run uh, on that that record. Okay, we're going to go through several different topics from healthcare. We'll talk COVID-19. We'll also go through some different social issues and get your take on those things. Also take some questions from people who are watching the Facebook Live as well as some questions from your opponent, Jill Shoup, in this race. And I want to start with this question uh, from Jill Shoup because I think it ties into what I just asked you. She wants to know, do you think that the people of Missouri District 2 are better off now than they were four years ago? 
Yes, I, I, I think they, they are. Um, if, if you can set aside what's happened with the pandemic, obviously, this has been a, a, a terrible time, obviously, over the last seven months, but You know, up until January, hey, Samantha, that uh, that the median household income had risen well over seven percent. Unemployment was at a, a fifty-year low. Uh, people were keeping more of their hard-earned dollar. As I said, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was able to to help a, a median income family of four save about three thousand dollars on their taxes. And then, you know, this this horrible. Um, pandemic has, has hit us. And now what we're trying to do is build back from that, make sure that uh, we provide the, 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 the COVID relief packages, of, of which I've had the pleasure to vote for at least four different bipartisan packages to provide stimulus and unemployment, to provide treatments and vaccines and therapeutics and cures, uh, all in an effort to try and, and help uh, move this uh, Move, move forward on this health and safety issue that we have with the pandemic. But also help us to ensure that our kids are out and, and be playing sports in a healthy way, making sure that we're, we're taking care of our frontline heroes by the funding for our, our hospitals and um, uh, making sure, as I said, that, that, uh, that we're, we're doing all that we can to uh, to open up the economy, get people back to work, back to school, and get their lives back. So uh, up until the pandemic kind of rocked our world, Samantha, uh, I think that that uh, things were really going on a, on a right a right track. Um, I just want to mention, too, we are on Zoom, uh, so if we're having some connectivity issues with the Wi-Fi there, just be patient. It keeps coming back, so we're doing all right with that. Um, but I want to yep. focus a little bit on the specific issues that are affecting our region. Um, the population we know has been on decline. What are some things that need to be done in order to get the region back on track? Well, I, I will tell you, we've, we've got to um, make sure that we, again, open up our economy and, and make sure that, that jobs are thriving. I've worked hard uh, to make sure that we have a business environment here that is uh, attracting new new jobs. And if that means uh, going uh, things of this nature, uh, that public safety issues that I think are of great concern, healthcare is always uh, of, of great concern to I think uh, most of the constituents here in the second district, and I want to be able to talk about uh, about healthcare. I want to talk about my work that I've done to lower prescription drug drug prices to be sure and protect those who uh, uh, have pre existing conditions. The work that we've done during uh, during this COVID relief time in terms of therapeutics, in terms of working with Pfizer right here in the second district to come up with a uh, a vaccine. I think. All of those things are, 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 are very, very important in terms of, 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 as I said, growing jobs, growing our economy. Um, you know, I have the privilege of chairing the Suburban Caucus in Congress. And this caucus deals with real kitchen table issues, Samantha, that, that are on the minds of, of most of, of suburbia and most of the folks in the second district. And they're everything from their, their daily commute to um, lifelong learning, education issues, vocational tech issues. They're concerned about their health care. They want to make sure that it's at, at, a, at a low cost and, and as much choice as they possibly can, and that they're able to tailor their health care needs to their specific um, uh, situation. So moving things into the private sector, allowing for association health care plans, allowing for co-ops and catastrophic coverage, um, allowing for those for folks to put more money into their health savings accounts so they're more vested in their, their health care. And, and I want to make, make things really clear here, and, and you may be uh, going to touch on some health care issues here too more specifically, Samantha, but because my opponent has really, I think, um, distorted my record in a, in a, uh, just a, a, a terrible fashion. Uh, in terms of Obamacare or the ACA, most of the ACA has already, <clears throat> the courts have already gutted a good good chunk of it. There were two things, two things in the Affordable Care 
were very important and have been supportive of since the very beginning. The first is allowing young people to stay on their, their parents' uh, health care and health insurance until the age of 26. And the, and the second one, Samantha, is to make sure that under all circumstances, people with pre-existing conditions have coverage. I have voted four times to preserve the coverage of those who have pre-existing conditions. And I've even written a piece of legislation that I, um, I'm, I'm very proud of that would make it a fundamental right. It actually puts your pre-existing conditions protections into HIPAA, into your HIPAA protections so that, uh, so that no court, no matter what, can take them away. They're a part of your fundamental rights. And I think that those are, are two healthcare issues that are very, very important. Uh, public safety is, is key. And um, I want to talk a little bit about that, and I'll let you ask another question if you'd uh, if you'd like. Yeah, we'll absolutely get back into the ACA and your stance on that. We'll also talk a little bit about what the solution could be uh, for portions of it that are repealed and what could fill in those gaps. Um, but I want to get to a viewer question here real quick. You're talking about public safety. Right. So right. Elise right. is asking, and this even feeds on the question I was going to ask you about crime in the region. Regardless of what neighborhood the crime is in, it still reflects on the St. Louis region as a whole. Right. Um, so from Elise she's asking in your tenure you voted against every measure to address gun violence in our country you have voted for bills to reduce any regulation of guns do you not view gun violence as a public health issue um well that's flatly not true i can i can i can say and and yes i i you know i believe that tragically the murder rate is up in the city of st louis and gun violence is is um is terrible i'm i'm, I'm a mother i'm a grandmother i want our families safe and secure um, you know, we want to do whatever we can to to uh, uh, go after uh, those that are uh, illegally, uh, uh, you know, uh, hurting our region through gun violence. And I've there are three measures in particular, Samantha, that um, I want to uh, I want to talk about. One that uh, I voted for, passed, and was even. This actually went after the background checks and and um, uh, really did a lot to 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 uh, the fix Nix program that was signed into law to to clean up and to update and to make sure that that background check uh, Nix system was in in uh, much better shape. The other was a stop act, which helped harden our schools. The most you know, tragic thing at all that could happen would be. Uh, uh, to see something happen to our our school children, and this was grant money, and it was given in some right here in the St. Louis region to make sure that our school children are safe. And then I've got a piece of of legislation that um, I've introduced that would in, in increase the prosecution to those who attempt to illegally uh, purchase firearms. And I think. Uh, the illegal firearms and illegal uh, firearm purchases should be heavily prosecuted and and not allowed. So I've, I've done a lot uh, in terms of, of, of gun violence, but the crime situation continues. And I stand with our men and women in blue. I'm pleased to be the only candidate in this race, Samantha, who is endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police, who's endorsed by the St. Louis Police Association, who has so our first responders, our police, they're on the front line, um, are certainly uh, have been extremely supportive of, of, the, of the work that I'm doing. I know that they know I have their back and, uh, and they've, got that, they've got mine too. Um, what I'm most upset about is this uh, terrible trend that we're seeing uh, of defunding the police. And I can say that my opponent is associated herself with, and her grassroots organi organization is is um, is fed by those uh, groups that actually have as one of their key mottos to defund the police. And uh, and not only is it the company uh, that she keeps and those that are supporting her campaign, that of Jill Shoops, she's also voted during her 12 years in the legislature at least five times to defund public safety budgets. And this is corrections budgets. This is highway patrol. This is into law 
by Democrat governors like Jay Nixon. So, uh, so yes, I'm very concerned about the crime situation, violence, and things of this nature. Uh, but I don't think defunding the police is um, is any way to go. And now we're seeing a, a brand new discussion in our St. Louis metro area about defunding the military, uh, which is in the Department of Defense in the Pentagon. It's uh, it's it's just uh, I think it's reprehensible. So uh, uh, there you go. So you touched on defunding the police as well as uh, education. So in your opinion, then, do you think that police departments should be funded more than uh, schools and education? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think that there's room to do to, to, to do both. And uh, certainly uh, the state does most of the funding of um, of education. And um, I think it's very, very important that uh, that we're funding our, our education uh, uh, programs. And, um, and I also think it's important that we stand behind our, our law enforcement. Uh, we're not going to be able to grow as an economy. We're not going to be able to, to feel safe and secure if our public safety is at, um, is at, at risk. And, and I have to say that, that I am, am, am pleased pleased to have supported the, the Justice Act. When we talk about police in nature, um, in in uh, Washington, D.C., this is a piece of legislation that was crafted by a very good friend of mine, Senator Tim Scott, um, uh, and it, it has a whole wide range of, of things that it does from, from making sure that lynching is a federal hate crime to taking option or action to stop, um, uh, stop the, the use of chokeholds. It, it makes sure everyone has equipped with, with body cameras and scales down the no-knock warrants, uh, establishes and improves, I think, transparency and accountability for use of force. These kinds of things, like the Justice Act, that I've been very proud to, to stand behind, are, are important in our, in our region. And um, I'm just pleased that our St. Louis Police Department and most of the municipal police departments um, have some of the highest accreditations in the in, in frankly, in the entire um, in the entire country. And I think we saw this uh, post Ferguson in 20 brave men and women have, that are serving um, uh, have, have, have done and stepped up uh, is, is I think been a real testament to our region. Okay, I want to go back to health care here real quick. Uh, the Republicans and President Trump right now are in court to repeal the Affordable Care Act. That was something big that the president has run on, wanting to repeal that. Uh, also, your opponent, Jill Shoup, has stated that you voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act five times. She's wanting to know how you would respond to that. But I also have a question from Sandy, who's asking, what is the Republican plan for health care to replace Obamacare? Well, I really appreciate that, and yes, the courts have um, have, have certainly gutted a, a good good portion of the affordable uh, uh, of the Affordable Care Act. And, and let's be really clear here: in the sec in the second congressional district, only four about four percent of this district, the constituents in this district, are actually on Obamacare or the ACA. The the vast majority of the constituents here in the second district, seventy seven percent, in fact, Samantha get their health care through private employer health care providers. Another 12 to 13 percent, and these are all census numbers, 12 to 13 percent receive their health care uh, through Medicaid. You know it um, now. Uh, another small percentage may be on Medicaid, another small percentage um, may be uninsured, but only 4 percent are on ACA. And as I said, to the, the two main things that uh, that I stand behind when it comes to the Affordable Care Act is keeping kids that, that uh, on their parents' insurance uh, through the age of 26 and being sure that we cover those with pre-existing conditions by actually making it a fundamental right and putting it in their in their HIPAA protections so that it doesn't matter what would happen in a court. And what we have to replace things with is through the private sector, as I talked about, the healthcare needs that they have to their own individual needs with the proper access, the choice, lowering the cost uh, is important. You know, why does a 28 year old um, uh, young man who's who's not married doesn't have any kids why should he be forced to get pediatric dental maybe all he wants is catastrophic care or or coverage um uh, maybe they can be part of an association health care plan 
This is farmers um, um, can form their own association. Realtors can form their own associations. All of those are, are very, very important, along with, um, as I said, being able to, uh, to have more skin in the game personally by doubling, tripling the amount of uh, health savings accounts that individuals are able to put in tax-free into their own uh, into their own savings. I think that putting this in the private and is going to provide the kind of access um, that we need. But the one thing we cannot do is what my opponent has done. She has sponsored twice Medicare for All, which is full-on government control of health care. Um, it will take away health care as you know it in this district. So the 77% that, that have their private employer health care, that would disappear. It would go away. Medicare as you know it would go away. I mean, these are two pieces of legislation. They weren't tagged on or amended. They were full on Medicare for all with her uh, support and sponsorship. In fact, when Obamacare or the ACA was even being crafted, uh, Jill Shoup is a part of something called the Progressive States uh, Network. A group of legislators across the, uh, the country wrote a letter to President Obama saying that the ACA and Obamacare didn't go far enough. She wanted a single payer system and in fact then spice in, um, um, in, or in, uh, in the state legislature. So again, I think one of the worst things we can do is take away people's health care as they receive it right now, knowing that about 90% of this district gets it through their employer or through uh, the, the Medicare system. I want to get to COVID-19 here in just a second, but I also want to ask you this question from Connie. Um, it says, tell us your thoughts on supporting public schools. Many state states cut funding for education before anything else. Governor Parson did that this year and then funneled the funding into tourism. I'm did it cut out on I'm you? Sorry, you, you, you nope, you, that's okay. I can read it again. It, it says something about public education. Yeah. Public education. Tell us your thoughts on public schools. Many states will cut funding for education before they cut anything else. Governor Parson did that this year and then funneled the funding into tourism. Well, again, this is something that's handled at the state level. Um, uh, to me, uh, when it comes to education, and yes, um, I support public education, private education, charter schools. Um, uh, allowing uh, uh, folks to have the kind of choice to get into a, a, a good school. We've got wonderful public education here uh, in, in the region, in the second district. Uh, but to me, as I, again, this is a state issue. And when it comes to public education and education in general, I believe that uh, we should the federal government should stay out of it, out of it as, as best as, as, as possible. This should be decided by teachers and school boards. That's how we need to address, I think, public education. Um, you know, get the federal government out to the extent that you possibly can and uh, address those issues at the state and local area. I think we've seen that as, as schools have begun to open up. Uh, which is something that I have, have um, obviously spent time in Congress providing some of the funds so that we can open our schools up safely and making sure that uh, uh, that each school district ta tailors how they, they reopen um, themselves, whether they're doing a hybrid me method, whether they're, they're, they're full on in class learning, whether they're still doing it virtually. Again, Education issues need to be made not at the federal level, but certainly at the most state, local, school board, parent, teacher, I think, level. So then my question off of that is, is if the United States is falling behind in our education rates, um, at what point does that become a federal issue? Well, as I said before, I believe that education issues are best um, serviced uh, between the, the uh, uh, at the most local level, between school boards, between teachers, school, school districts. Um, you know, I, I believe that it's important that we be lifting up STEM uh, areas and, and, and reinforcing, especially with young girls, to get them involved in science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, our STEM uh, statistics in the United States are, are, are not as strong as they should be. And so whatever we can do to, to fund STEM, 
um, uh, kinds of education in, in those uh, technical areas, I think is important. And sometimes the work that we've done in, in, to provide grants and funding for vocational tech. You know, education isn't just about um, um, elementary school. Not everybody wants to go to college. What we can do with our community colleges and our VOTech training, I think, is important. And I've supported many of the, of the grants uh, here in the area that uh, will help with that kind of community-based uh, education. I want to get into coronavirus. That is a major topic of this election. We're now seven months into the pandemic. Um, we're at a point right now where we are seeing surges in states across the country, including right here in Missouri. In your opinion, do you think at the federal level that there's being or that there's enough being done for Americans? Well, I will tell you um, that I've been able to participate and pass four different bipartisan uh, COVID relief packages, providing um, everything from unemployment insurance to stimulus checks, uh, the small business loan program, the PPP program that kept employees attached to their employers was very, very important. Providing uh, funds for our, our daycares, for our schools, for our hospitals, sending money to the state and local level. We were able to provide through the CARES package uh, about $174 million dollars for uh, St. Louis County alone. Now, I've been upset about uh, how it's been distributed and the fact that it's taken so long to get that money out the door, especially to our municipalities that have been bearing the cost of, of, uh, of some of the um, um, health safety issues and some of the public safety and move that money forward. But to answer your question, Samantha, there is more that has to be done. And I am tired of using this pandemic and watching Speaker Pelosi uh, use it as a political football. I stand ready to return at a moment's notice to pass another uh, another COVID relief package. We've got packages ready to go. Uh, money even left over from the CARES Act that would provide small business loan funding to some of the mo more uh, deeply hurt uh, areas. Uh, and when it comes to small business, that would be perhaps in the um, entertainment industry, in, in the restaurant and retail industry, all of those uh, really need another jolt of, of, of the, the small business loan that are forgivable in most cases. We also need to, to provide more stimulus, more money for, for therapeutics and vaccines to make sure that we can get them distributed. So I will tell you, that um, uh, be using this in any kind of a partisan fashion. We can do this piece by piece by piece, uh, come together, get it done. We did it on four packages and it's time that we do it um, uh, again. And I, they seem to be very close and I hope that we'll be returning uh, next week uh, to pass another another bipartisan package. Yeah, and I certainly think that's something that is definitely important to a lot of people as small businesses have been having a hard time as well as American families that have been struggling since the start of this pandemic, certainly. And I, I, I will tell you, it's been I, probably one of the, the most rewarding things that we've done as a district office here, all of, uh, of our staff working with individual um, constituents who, who feel isolated, they feel uh, alone, they're they're afraid uh, of what may come next, and I don't. It, it could be that that veteran who um, hasn't been out of the house in a long time, that uh, uh, older American who wants to hug their grandkids, someone who uh, benefits. Uh, how can they get their stimulus check that that maybe didn't arrive? Or as you said, these businesses, small businesses, they need another injection of the PPP loan program that will help them keep their employees attached to the employer. I also sponsored legislation that, um, that would cover anyone who was unemployed because of the pandemic. It gave a premium assistance to their health care coverage so that they would be able to keep the health care that they had on their, on their, from their employer through a premium, premium assistance package uh, and keep that um, um, uh, for a longer period of time uh, while they were working through the um, unemployment system here and hopefully getting, getting back to work. We're seeing things improve, but, but, but honestly, um, uh, there is so much more that needs to be done and there's so much more that we have to come together uh, to get done. 
you know, I think jumpstarting this economy is the most important thing. I think keeping, letting people keep more of, as I said, their hard earned money, lowering their taxes, uh, the kinds of provisions that I've supported stand in stark contrast with my opponent, Jill Shoup, who has in her 20 year, 20 year political career has raised tax um, numerous, numerous times, not just income taxes, but property taxes three times. One time she tried to raise them 21% when she was on the school board. Uh, vehicle taxes, gas taxes, utility taxes, sales taxes. Uh, as we're talking about COVID and, and trying to move beyond the pandemic and, and get our economy and our jobs moving again, uh, we have to make sure that uh, we are not overburdening our constituents with with higher taxes and more regulation. You mentioned Jill Shoup's uh, 20 year long uh, career in politics. Is there anything that she's done in that 20 years that you do support? Well, um, I'm, I'm sure that, as I said, I'm sure that that uh, after after over 20 years of, of service, um, I'm, you know, there, I'm sure there is something that she's done that that I'm supportive of. of but um, I guess what I'm most supportive of is anyone who's willing to get in the game, put your name, on the on the ballot run and try and serve your community so and um and i applaud anyone who's willing to jump into the arena here and to try and 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 help their neighbors and uh as i said this district is personal to me this is uh this is home for me my family and um i think that that helping your neighbor especially during some of these really difficult times uh, is very, very important. So I, my hat's off to to anyone who's willing to to dig in and uh, engage and try and and um, and help their 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 neighbor, as I said. It takes a lot of gumption to run for public office. It certainly does. We do appreciate you taking the time with us this evening, Congresswoman Wagner. We do. Uh, we'll speak with you on election night. That is November third. We also will look forward to seeing your questions. We're going to do hopefully with Facebook Live with uh, Jill Shoup here pretty soon as well. And we'd like to ask your questions of her as well. Keep it fair. We did the same to you. And we want to thank everybody who tuned in on Facebook Live. Thank you for your questions. We'll see you soon. Great to be with you. Thank you, Samantha.